Hi there, everyone. This is Sarah D. Haven. I am a psychic spiritual counselor and astrologer, alumnus of the House of White Metaphysical Academy, and associate member of the Evolutionary Astrology Network, run by Kim Marie Weimer and Leroy. I am presenting for you today, Understanding the Narcissist and the Empath. This will be an astrological overview, so I want to be very clear about that. It is an overview. <laughs> we can get really deep into the narcissist and empath psycho, uh, psychology. That, that could take us hours, days, weeks, months. What I hope to do for you in this Zoom meeting is give you something to think about with regard to how we could see the narcissist empath psychology or relationship dynamic. Um, something to think about that might be outside of what you've been taught, what you've heard, and we'll be doing all of that by using astrology as a lens to glean information, which I, I think is a pretty cool technique. So without further ado, let's get started. So yes, uh, here's the summary. Uh, in today's Zoom meeting, we will be making use of natural law. We'll also be making use of natural law, of course, right? This is me we're talking about. I love natural law. <clears throat> and we're going to also be using astrology in order to glean a clearer understanding of the psychology of the narcissist and empath and why these psychologies exist at present in our modern society. So we'll be looking into that as well. Um, and we're going to look at the impact of the psycho these psychologies, how um, they're impacting the collective, mental emotion mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, um, our quality of life and um, our evolution as individuals and a collective species, how this dynamic is impacting that. I'm hoping we can touch on all of that in this hour. So let's start off by defining the terms. I'm using very basic definitions here. We could look into uh, the DSM-4 or 5 or whatever it is and get very technical um, medical science-based definitions, but really if we boil it down to its bare bones, which is what we're going to be using astrology for incidentally, we can define nar the narcissist and the empath quite simply. And as you can see on the screen, here it is, I'll read it for you if you can't see for whatever reason. What is a narcissist? A narcissist is someone who is self-centered and largely unconcerned with the feelings or negative impact that they have on others. We could see them as users, exploiters, these kinds of things. Narcissists can perceive and intuit the feelings of others often enough, but they don't really care about the feelings of others as such. They're more self-focused and, and not overly concerned with them. Um, with harm done to others, unless it directly impacts their quality of life or their success or their aims or their goals. Next, we have, what is an empath? Good question, yeah? So very simply put, a person with a strong awareness or hypersensitivity to the emotional energies of others. Empaths tend to consider other people above and or before themselves and can often, often victimize themselves as a result. With balance between poles comes equilibrium and equanimity. So as it says in the slide, today we're going to be looking at the polarity of Aries and Libra. Now we could look at the narcissist and empath from a lot of the different zodiac signs, but I feel that because the Aries Libra axis is, well, it's a cardinal angle. It is the first angle, really, uh, Aries Libra. And as such, being that it is also self and other, we can glean some really great information into the narcissist empath dynamic. Um, we'll also be looking into how the, uh, some of the other signs play into this as well to give us some more texture and color with regard to how we're understanding the narcissist and empath. So yes, um, today we'll, we will examine the polarity of Aries and Libra while taking into consideration the distortions of our current societal familial constructs via Capricorn and Cancer. 
ignore my typo. You know what I'm saying there. It's not caner, it's cancer. <laughs> um, so through this, wow, typos abound, we can gain useful insight into why the narcissist empath relationship paradigm exists as it does at current, looking at the cardinal angles, Cancer, Capricorn, Aries, and Libra. So also I wanted to point out here that the narcissist empath imbalance exists with a, within a staggering number of individuals on our planet varying from a minor imbalance within an individual to an extreme imbalance in other individuals. And while I, I don't want to say it's every single person who's experiencing the narcissist empath dynamic within themselves or extremes of that um, and in their relationships, it is, it is a pretty staggering amount of people. It seems as though it's almost popular these days to claim to be an empath and as such as an empath other people are narcissists or it's, it seems as well too that many relationships not just romantic but familial platonic um, um, work relationships working relationships we can observe a lot of people talking about how there's uh, how someone is a narcissist in that relationship dynamic or how they are an empath um, who attracts narcissists. We hear this as well, and em empaths who attract narcissists, or narcissists who seek out empaths. Um, and uh, so it seems to be talked about quite a lot these days, and not, not really surprising, I think, in some ways, when we look at what's going on in the astrological weather these days, especially with Neptune being in Pisces, and of course, to like just even looking at the south nodes of Pluto and Saturn, um, and even Jupiter being in Capricorn, and then at current day having Pluto literally in Capricorn, Saturn in Capricorn, and soon enough, Jupiter in Capricorn, though I'm digressing. We can have memories of being exploited on a soul level. It seems that we're being asked to perhaps evolve out of these these confining structures where we're being exploited where it, it, i hope i'm i hope you're picking up what i'm putting down i hope i'm making sense so let's move on so why do these psychological psychologies exist at present in our modern society this is of course i you know i should have said this in the beginning because it's really important to note this is based on my own observations so i hope that because of that, you understand that I am not trying to preach or tell you how things are. Uh, I'm merely presenting information for your consideration to help you better understand these dynamics or to help you fill in some blanks. Um, if this doesn't resonate with you, um, that's one thing. But uh, I, I just want to be clear that I, I'm not claiming to be the arbiter of um, or the authority on this matter. This, again, is just based on my perspective and my studies. So yes, why do these psychologies exist at modern, at present in our modern society? Pretty simple from what I can tell. An imbalance between polarities of all kinds exists within our society, and that boils down to an imbalance very simply. If we were going to look at this bare bones, it, it, it boils down to an imbalance between the feminine and masculine. Uh, we can look at Capricorn again, as I was mentioning earlier, um, in evolutionary astrology, from what I understand, Capricorn is synonymous with patriarchy. Patriarchy objectively is not a negative thing, but if we observe our society, we can certainly see that patriarchal structures that are in place and have been in place for a very long time are quite distorted and quite imbalanced and patriarchy the reason why i'm bringing that up is that is a masculine dynamic yes capricorn is a feminine sign but patriarchy does speak to that masculine paternal figure so if we think about parents cancer being the mother and capricorn being the father it is still a yin quality but it is a masculine yin and um, I'll, I'll get into the law of gender in a minute, but I just want to say uh, very briefly, everything for the most part has multiple genders within it. 
And uh, we can see with the Capricorn archetype that it is a mixture of, of masculine and feminine. So yeah, when we, have, we see an imbalance of masculine, right, where it's super rigid, um, not exactly compassionate, um, violating the boundaries of, of, of others, you know, and their sovereignty, uh, not necessarily, again, empathic, right? So it's that narcissist dynamic, we could even say that's like off into an extreme. And sure, we could look at Leo and say, well, Leo is a narcissist, Sarah. So why are you talking about Capricorn? But it's, but so like and that's you know of course leo is the narcissist i just want to say blanket statement your your mileage may vary based on a person's level of awareness and how in tune they are with their true self or you know what kind of issues they're dealing with etc but like when you look at capricorn and we can look at see narcissist in all signs we can see it in pisces we could see it in virgo and we could see it in Libra, which I'll get to in a moment. Capricorn can, of course, show a narcissist dynamic too, because it's not necessarily considering other individuals, only its own ends and its own goals, we could say, when we're looking at it from the perspective of a distorted patriarchal paradigm, right? And so we have that we could consider when we talk about the imbalance in the masculine gender and then we can look at the imbalance in the feminine gender and these are energies and qualities not necessarily like all females on the planet and all men on the planet there is an imbalance in the feminine as well where there's a willingness or almost maybe a conditioned response to slide right into the victim mentality to let people use them and exploit them, this energy. Another distortion of the feminine can be shadow sides too, like jealousy and vindictiveness, but not necessarily taking action on that, letting that seethe and boil within, and even maybe perhaps repressing that anger and rage. We can also see in a distorted feminine manipulation, codependency, and these kinds of things. And when we look at our society, because the society that we live in is not necessarily nurturing or encouraging autonomy, sovereignty, and self-sufficiency, self-esteem even, and instead it's seemingly so, encouraging the, qual the distorted qualities of both genders I mentioned a minute ago, it's, it, it, it's plain to see why these things are happening. With time, balance may come, but from what I can tell, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be largely from us as individuals taking on the mantle to, to mature and nourish and nurture ourselves we're not necessarily going to get such nourishment and encouragement and direction from our governments and from other authority or parental figures. Now, perhaps you, live in, you, you grew up in a family where that isn't so and you had a great family and the mother, father, uh, masculine, feminine dynamics that raised you were balanced but uh, be aware that, that you are in the minority uh, as far as society is concerned. Most of us didn't have that luxury. So there's going to be invariably dis distortions and imbalances within our feminine and masculine inside of us. And also we can observe it in our communities and in our society and our country at large. Countries at large. So moving on at the slide, could it be that distortions within both genders have been propagated by a distorted social societal cultural paradigm because the entities in power prefer the masses to be out of connection with their power or connection to their power talk about cutting off one's nose to spite one's face yes <laughs> um let's just think about this logically and i could be wrong about this of course but it's very interesting 
to consider what in a toxic patriarchal paradigm would be required to maintain one's station and one's level of power over the populace. One of the key methods that seems to be and being employed and has been employed for seemingly thousands of years is to keep the masses stupid, to keep the masses out of connection to their power and to keep them unaware that any of any power within them or balance could exist without the guidance and support of government or, um, or monarchies. In the short term, if, and even if we're looking at thousands of years, like evolutionarily speaking, that's short term. In the short term, that seems like a winning solution or strategy for the powers um, in place or the power elite, we could call them, or, um, you know, governments and monarchies. Sure, that makes sense on a short term, I guess. But if you're not thinking long term, you know, if you're thinking long term, I mean to say, it may, the cutting one's nose off to, this, to spite one's face line that I put in there makes a lot of sense. Because if we consider the fact that the track that we're on as a species is very likely to be extinction or self-annihilation of some kind, I can't imagine that it would have been worth it to hold down others. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? Because that is very much a narcissistic way of handling a country, a planet, a populace, where you're only thinking about yourself and your own gratification. You're not considering the satisfaction and gratification of others. And then on top of that, not thinking long term about the survival of the species, or maybe they are, who knows? It just seems to me on paper, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And this of course happens when we become imbalanced in the feminine and masculine in either direction. Um, because when we think about it, to, have, to evoke true harmony and to foster true harmony between like interpersonally nationally, globally, and even just as, as a species living on this planet, a balance between masculine and feminine within and in the outer world and how governments are structured are going to be required for us to thrive and to live and not kill ourselves, right? So where am I going with that? I had a point. Yeah, my point was essentially just how interesting it is that we can see that narcissist empath dynamic happening all over because a lot of people um, in the consensus, which is a large chunk of the populace, I believe it's like 70% of the population, according to Jeffrey Wolf Green, 70% of the, the population are apologists for an exploitative and narcissistic government, shadow government, power elite. How interesting is that? Let's move on to uh, a couple of natural law principles that I'd like to share with you. I am taking these natural law principles from the Kybalion, which is a book that is very inexpensive that teaches the seven hermetic principles of natural law. It's written by some in entities or an entity that refers to themselves as the three initiates. <laughs> um, the jury's still out as to who these individuals are or if it's just one individual. But one thing about this book is that it very simply states seven principles or laws of natural law that make a lot of sense as far as how this construct is, is built. So we're gonna take a look at two of those right now. Very important one, the law of polarity. Well, they're all important really. The law of polarity. Everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature 
but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths. All paradoxes can be reconciled. So here's the part I would like to highlight. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. We're going to get a bit deeper into that as we move on when we examine Libra and Aries, because it's interesting enough, from what I gather and from what I can tell, the narcissist and empath are essentially two sides of one polarity, which means they're two extremes that can meet in the center to find harmony. Like cold and hot, when they meet in the center, they become warm. Next, I wanted to look into the law of gender. So, the law of gender, gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles, or we can call them yin principles feminine, or yang principles masculine, or as Kimmery Weimer likes to, to uh, use rather than masculine and feminine because it can be triggering to some people. She likes to say active, I believe it is for masculine, and passive for feminine, something like that. And I'm, I apologize if I'm misquoting you, Kimri. Uh, so yes, gender manifests on all planes. What that means is, is gender manifests in the mental plane, the emotional plane, the spiritual plane, and the physical plane. For instance, mental plane, just briefly, when you send out a thought, when you are actively thinking about something or concentrating, that is a masculine or yang way of utilizing the mental plane. When you are receiving an intuition or a psychic impression, clairvoyant impression or something of the sort, that is a feminine way of utilizing or being within the mental realm or plane. Gender manifests in everything in our reality. It's almost like even binary, ones and zeros. Yeah? When, when we boil things down, it, it is very binary. Of course, because gender exists in everything, there's going to be a blending of all uh, of, of both genders, so we can see many different color shades and textures. This is why when we see some women, they could be quite assertive and quote unquote masculine, fire element, right? Or air element, a lot of fire or air within them, they could be seen as quote unquote masculine, although they're biologically female. We can also see men who are biologically male, who have a lot of yin energy in them, and so we're going to see, especially when you look at astrology, we see every shade and texture and difference within a person, since everyone is as unique as their own fingerprint, and no two individuals can be repeated exactly the same. <clears throat> Everyone's a special snowflake, yes? <laughs> um, because of this fact, we're going to see many different blends of genders, regardless uh, of you know, genders within an individual, regardless of their biological gender. The reason why I say this is because it's very important to understand that the narcissist archetype, we could call it, is not necessarily going to be masculine or a man. And it may not be necessarily a female or feminine in energy. Um, and the same goes, you know, with vice versa. So at current, imbalances of all kinds exist in a variety of polarities here on this, on, on this reality. But it all boils down to the imbalance between the feminine and masculine. As I said, I want to keep saying that because even if you look at our society and, and all of that is what is wrong with our society, and I use air quotes because, you know, from a higher perspective, it's, it is all written, they say, um, so... Perhaps it isn't wrong, and maybe from an evolutionary perspective, this all needed to happen to get us to where we are. That's entirely possible, and it may just be exactly what's going on here. But when we look at our society, look at our world and everything that's wrong, again, in <laughs> the world, it all boils down to the schism between masculine and feminine. 
men and women. So, and to top that off, there's a massive distortion that can be observed both in the masculine and feminine within humans at this point in time. This seems to be a key contributing factor in the extremes we see in society, the prevalence of the narcissist empath relationships. As I was saying earlier, we can see this in a romantic relationship where one person's being taken advantage of and the other one is doting on that person and making excuses for them, trying to save them, uh, you, you know, um, utilizing compassion um, and, and ultimately victimizing themselves. We can see that in a romantic relationship. We can see that between friends. We can see that between parents and children, aunts and children, grandparents and children, um, you know, these kinds of things. We can see them in all different relationship dynamics. But with inner brain balance, <laughs> inner balance or brain balance, comes equanimity, equality, and wholeness. Not just when it comes to one-on-one -on -one narc empath dynamics, this statement is also true in regard to the inner landscape and the outer world. So, you know, it, this, this slide is essentially, re, you know, repeating what I was just saying, but it is really true. When we're balanced between the passive side of ourselves and the assertive side of ourselves, the yin and the yang, we come into more congruence with wholeness. When we can defend ourselves, when we have enough self-esteem to set up healthy boundaries, when we are within integrity enough to be honest, even if it could cause a, cause a conflict, when we are being true to our conscience and being centered within ourselves, whole and centered within our mind, we become who we truly are and we're empowered. And again, we are whole. So development of a thorough knowledge of who one is, is key to becoming whole and balanced within both genders, within the self, the masculine and feminine sides of us. So to know thyself is to know the universe. You may have heard that axiom before. It's not just cool sounding, although it really is cool sounding, <laughs> at least in my opinion. It is how it truly is. When we know ourselves from within, we understand the universe and this reality that we live in here on earth in this country or whatever country you live in, in whatever community or society you live in, you understand how it operates. It seems paradoxical because you would think you'd need to go to the outer world to learn how the outer world operates. And in part, that's true. But to really understand the deeper meanings of what's going on here and what's, how things operate, we must know who we are. So sometimes an empath may take on a victim mentality. And, and think, why me? I'm trying to be such a good person. I care so much. Maybe, if I, maybe I just need to care more. Or maybe I just need to blah, blah, blah. You know? And that seems to be looking into the outer world for answers when the answers are truly within. And if an empath is honest with themselves, they would know that the, that the dynamic they're in is exploitative on some level, either by them the other, or both. And the narcissist is the same. To find wholeness within themselves, it's imperative to listen to the inner landscape. If they're truly listening to the inner landscape, their conscience will alert them to the fact that their behavior is unacceptable, to the fact that their be behavior is out of step with higher awareness. All right, let's move on for time's sake, because I still have lots to go through. Wow, I talk a lot. All right, so did you know that being in the extreme of both ends of a polarity is possible? You actually can be in the, in the extremes of both. This implies that extreme narcissism, narcissism can manifest simultaneously as, and uh, at the same time, extreme empathy. The narcissistic empath and the empathic narcissist both do indeed exist. The former may have effectively convinced themselves or itself that it is not everyone else who is the narcissist or that it is everyone else who's the narcissist due to a lack of awareness and the projection onto others of what exists within while the latter uses the empathic faculty to use people without discretion and may be aware of this or in denial of that tendency. 
In modern society, these psychological behavioral tendencies run rampant among, among the consensus due to the distortion seen in cultural societal influences propagated by the masses or to the masses and the resultant lack of awareness that can be observed on an individual level among the populace. Keying into the truth by knowing who we truly are and facing our inner narcissist and our inner empath. It's not always going to be comfortable, but yet it's necessary for growth and a better world. So with an effort to sink to the higher echelons of awareness, i.e. natural laws and principles, rather than reaching to the upper echelons that society expects of us, such distortions can be diminished and ultimately dissipated, both individually and collectively. So here we go. I'm going to look at this very briefly with you. We've got Mars, Aries, and Libra, Venus. Interestingly enough, this they're both young, active, masculine signs. Aries is first stage awareness, and Venus is second stage awareness. So when I say this, I'm not talking about your evolutionary awareness as per evolutionary astrology. What I mean is, is Aries is in the first third of the zodiac, if we were to take the 12 signs and break them up into thirds, it's in the first stage, largely self-focused. Venus, on the other hand, is in the second stage, largely focused on others. And briefly, the third stage is more focused on the bigger picture. Yes? So, some keywords about Aries to help us understand this. Now, the reason why I bring up Aries as a narcissist, again, is because it's largely self-focused and lacking awareness of others. Um, and of course, when I say that, I'm talking about more of the imbalance when it's really into the Aries side of the polarity and, and the seesaw is very imbalanced. So these keywords I have here, they're more objective as far as Aries energy is concerned. They can go in either direction based on how they're being utilized by an individual. The first, me first, the baby, sure of itself. Honest, forthright, the fighter, the initiator, the leader, does not take well to following orders, does not automatically consider others or their needs, takes what it wants and needs first, interfaces with the world without thought, impulse-driven, loner, selfish. None of these, again, I want to be very clear, are inherently negative qualities or attributes. It's how we utilize them. That's what's going to determine what kind of karma we're sowing. For instance, being selfish, not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, Libra kind of needs that if we're looking at it in an imbalanced state, especially if it's being exploited by an Aries type of an energy that has a complete disregard for it. And again, when I say complete disregard, just need to be clear, I'm talking about in the extreme distortion or imbalance of Aries. So some key words for Venus. Others first. The diplomat, unsure of self versus sure of itself with Aries. Silver tongue, well spoken, yes. Negotiator, listening skills, observational skills. Neediness, codependency, projection. What's fair for both of us, considerate of others' points of view, relationship-oriented cooperation and collaboration. Venus interfaces with others in their world thoughtfully. Wants and needs are met through and with others. Selfless, lacking a self, no self, because it's very other person-centric. It can lose itself. It's a mirror. It's a chameleon. Courtesan. Who do you want me to be? Cerebral, mental. So here we go uh, with some cool stuff that I feel um, can give us some context into how to, you know, yeah, like this, I'll just read the slide. <laughs> One way to get context into ways to express healthy iterations of the sign is to consider the sign that pre preceded it and the sign that follows it. So, of course, we've got Scorpio following Libra coming next, and then we've got Virgo preceding it. So, Virgo is a waning semi-sextile to Libra. It's closing, you'll see on the screen there. 
closing. And Scorpio is waxing, so it's moving away from Libra. The waning semi-sextile between Virgo and Libra shows us the importance of humility. Compassion for all of Earth's beings. So I'm going to be talking about this from multiple perspectives, individual and collectively, yes? A healthy sense of humility is very important. Um, the practice of non-prejudicial discernment, so to be able to see others truly for who they are without preconceived notions or prejudgments, yes? Refraining from assumptions without facts. Releasing the past feelings of being less than, because in Virgo being semi-sextile and a closing semi-sextile to Libra, there may be some memories of the past of being less than or disregarded and maybe even thinking that that might be okay. Or there might even be bitterness towards that. So releasing past feelings of being less than in order to align with timeless truths, higher truths, and to be impeccable to one's word. Because Libra, when it's iterating from its most balanced state, it is impeccable to its word. Justice and fairness and honor are highly important to it, as, of course, other people are. Fairness in relationships and harmony in relationships makes a happy Libra, yeah? Then there's the waxing semi-sextile from Libra to Scorpio. And this means, and these are just some ways that we can interpret it, yeah? It's not the ultimate be-all, end-all. The waxing semi-sextile means to help us to find stability in the Libra archetype by being centered in our power emotionally, investigating what shadows and manipulative tendencies within us that may require transmutation and to ask why. Why do they exist? Where do they come from? What are they about? And why are they hiding? <laughs> to be honest about where we are out of integrity with our true core essence. Honesty with ourselves by having a willingness to look into the shadows. So it's interesting because any sign in the zodiac, it's not just here with Libra and in a moment we'll look at Gem or uh, <laughs> Aries, any sign in the zodiac, if you want to get more information, one uh, more information about how it um, can be utilized in its most healthy and natural iteration, its most empowered iteration, consider the sign that comes before it and the sign that comes after it and what kind of knowledge or wisdom they have to impart to that sign that we're examining. We can also get an idea of how, um, how it is that they are evolving and what they've evolved from. So, yeah, looking at Aries here, you'll see that Pisces is in a waning semi-sextile to Aries. And so we can see that because we're moving in a counterclockwise direction from one sign to the next. And then with Aries, we can, or with Taurus, we can see that it is a waxing semi-sextile to Aries. It's moving away from Aries. So let's see. Again, like I was saying, it's, this is a great way, and this is just one of many great astrological techniques. There's so many, and this is just one I offer to you to get context into ways to express healthy iterations of Aries. Let's consider the sign that preceded it and the sign that follows it. So with the waning semi-sextile, which is the one from Pisces to Aries, we can see the need to be tapped into higher consciousness in order to be, and to be aware instinctively so, mind you, to be aware instinctively so of the karmic implications of our actions before doing so. Before doing. <laughs> Sorry, let me do that again. Um, yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm saying this so that it actually makes sense, right? So the waning semi-sextile shows us the need to be tapped into higher consciousness in order to be, and to be aware instinctively so of the karmic implications of our actions before doing. So we can be unfettered and still be in line with natural law because Aries doesn't like to sit around mulling things over and considering, you know, option A, option B, option C, option 1262Z. 
right? It wants to just be who it is, act on impulse and instinct, be completely unfettered and free to be itself. And so when it's tapped into Pisces, that psychic ability, it can actually channel through itself as a conduit, a knowing of higher truths, compassion, consideration of the greater good, the whole, and then act from that and be in more integrity to, to who it truly is. So the waxing semi-square or semi-sextile, which is the one between Taurus and Aries there, that waxing semi-sextile shows us that through awareness of our own intrinsic worthiness and the worthiness of all beings that we interface with day to day, moment to moment, everything that we interact with, knowing that they are worthy, knowing that we are also worthy in the highest way possible, but also in the most humble and earthly way possible, we can act from self-esteem and esteem for others. We act autonomously from this space and we act freely because we are secure in our connection to the earth. We are secure in knowing that we are supported, AKA there's nothing to lack. We're not wanting for anything. And when we're in that kind of space from an Aries archetype perspective, also taking into account that Pisces energy, this is what we could define as the peaceful warrior. The type of warrior that doesn't need to go around proving itself because it already knows that it's a winner, <laughs> you know? It already knows it can take care of itself and that it's equipped to do so when it needs to, but it doesn't need to go around pushing its weight around, throwing its weight around. There's an intrinsic regard for others, intrinsic consideration for others. Now, you know, not every narcissist that you come across, anyone who's been slapped with that label, is going to admit that they need to adjust their behavior, yes? But that doesn't take away from what facts are. Facts are facts. If they could come into this knowing that I'm asserting here or, or suggesting, <laughs> asserting, <laughs> that I'm suggesting here and asserting, I suppose, um, we could see a much more balanced, centered, and even happy, peaceful, content individual that doesn't need to exploit others, doesn't need to step on other people's necks to get what they want doesn't feel the need to conquer others. So uh, here's another thing, I reminder to myself, let's not forget about Pluto, Saturn, and the, uh, the, the south node of the moon being in Capricorn, and as well the north nodes of all of these planets being in Cancer too. Because at this point in time as a collective, we are at a place where we could really pivot in a positive direction or a negative direction based on our willingness to mature Capricorn and our willingness to care and nurture and love our family, which is not just our racial group or our national group or whatever. It's all beings. So not even just our species, yeah? All beings. If we can do this, do this from a level of of mature discernment, Capricorn, and diligence, we could nourish cancer, ourselves and the collective with no need to exploit others and no need to feel that we um, just need to kind of like bend like a, a limp, <laughs> limp noodle and get walked all over because, you know, with, uh, because of a lack of self-esteem or something of the sort. <laughs> so let's read the slide, Sarah. Gender roles are seen via Capricorn and Cancer from evolutionary astrology, or at least from what I understand of it. Both Cancer and Capricorn naturally square Aries and Libra, which means there's some cool information that they can impart to us as far as the challenges that both signs experience, at least from this lens, with regard to the narcissist, empath, dynamic, and behaviors and psychologies. So knowing this about the square 
two areas in Libra that both Cancer and Capricorn make, we can see that as a collective, we're being encouraged to evolve our awareness, the awareness of the masculine, which we could call the narcissist, we could, yes, and the feminine, the empath. And, you know, it's very interesting because now I think about it, you could call the feminine a narcissist, you could call the masculine an empath. But uh, for the purposes of this talk, <laughs> this third house, Saturn, Jupiter combo is going to try to stick to one direction, one angle on this. So yes, knowing this, we can see that as a collective, we're being encouraged to evolve our awareness of the masculine and the feminine, the narcissist and the empath, respectively. But will we get it in this time around on this evolutionary cycle? Or is it going to take more trips around the sun before we finally figure out that we need to become more aware of where we're exploiting others and where we are victimizing ourselves and wallowing in a victim mentality. Another great question to ask ourselves, and I don't mean to be fatalistic, <laughs> but it is a good question to ask because we are at a point where, uh, where we're going, what we do from, from here on out, is, is it has a, it's going to have a large contributing factor to where we ultimately end up. So, evolutionarily speaking, do we have the luxury of time this time around? Or is it time, time to get our ass in gear, <laughs> you know? All right. So I've got a few more slides to go through. When Aries, a.k.a. the narcissist, runs into Capricorn, a.k.a. Saturn, or society, or maturation, and maturation, again, um, we are seeing that there is a young active phase between Aries and Capricorn. Aries, again, is first stage awareness. Capricorn is third stage awareness. So third stage, again, like I was saying, is awareness of all, like society, the bigger picture. And first stage awareness is more kind of like what's in front of us, what's going on inside of ourselves. It's very uh, self-focused kind of energy. So we have a, if you look at this and we go counterclockwise from Capricorn to Aries, since Aries is the point that we are focusing on, we see a waning square. So that's a last quarter phase. Crisis in consciousness. Aries says, <laughs> and this is just my thing here, Aries says, "Oh, do I have to be mature to get to the top? And Capricorn says, you sure do, Sonny. Respect is earned. No one likes exploiters. And that's true. No one really does. Aries feels it necessary to establish itself within society in some shape or form. Remember, it is half of a polarity, right? So it does want to establish itself in, in, in the world or among others. It doesn't necessarily uh, want to be an island at this point in its development, that last quarter phase. And so it's experiencing difficulty at this stage of development in this last quarter crisis in consciousness stage. Experiencing difficulty in releasing the ego's instinctive proclivities in order to perform its societal role wisely. Aries doesn't necessarily, by default, the energy itself. It doesn't necessarily take on the responsibility to, to, to build wisdom, to develop wisdom. But as it matures, Capricorn, it becomes a necessity. And it could be, it could be you know, uh, more than likely through trial and error. Yes, because if we think about a ram and its horns just kind of going headfirst into things, eventually it's going to learn that if it keeps running headfirst into a wall, that it, it, it's going to have permanent brain damage, <laughs> right? It's going to learn how to adjust to its environment, to its society. Yes, so if this challenge is met with integrity and perseverance, Aries will reap beneficial rewar rewards evolutionarily and even societally in relationships. And when we think about the narcissist empath dynamic, this means that it will be more happy and successful relationships that they will form with people. And now this may be 
uh, this may be conjecture, and it largely is, but I mean, let's just ask ourselves this. Do you think a narcissist wants to be in an unhappy relationship? Do you think that if it could have an ideal relationship that it would prefer that? I mean, if they're just like literally right in front of you is that less than ideal relationship, that same karmic loop over and over again, and in an ideal relationship, and you literally have the option, let's just pretend you're the narcissist here, and you literally have the option to choose one or the other, what are you gonna choose, right? Now, um, in, in every individual is going to vary, but I would think most people would want their ideal relationship. And so building maturity and integrity and a willingness to take on responsibility, that will help to manifest ideal relationships for Aries. It just may feel like it's not necessarily worth it with that crisis in consciousness where it's like, God, do I have to grow up? Just a little. <laughs> yes. So let's move on to Libra. When Libra, the empath, encounters Capricorn society slash maturation, this is a young active phase being a square. We're going to be looking at squares of Cancer too, other young active phases. Um, and this is between Libra, Cardinal Air, and Capricorn, Cardinal Earth. Libra being second stage awareness, other people aware. Capricorn, third stage, bigger picture awareness, yes? So with Libra, interestingly enough, it's a waxing square. So this is a first quarter phase square where there's a crisis in action. So having difficulty finding action that works for them. They may be feeling opposition or not necessarily opposition, but challenges and friction when it comes to existing in society. Libra seems to meet society first. Aries meets society a little later. More than likely, this could be because Libra is other person focused, socially focused, yes? So of course, they, they, it stands to reason that they would meet with society before Capri or before Aries. So Libra says, what do I need to do in order to get you to like me? And Capricorn says, in all its wisdom, <laughs> integrity. Phoniness is too hollow to stand the test of time. Sounds like Capricorn might know what it's talking about. If we were thinking about the concepts of structural integrity, structure, skeletal structures, if we have a phony or, or poorly built structure that's lacking in structural integrity, it's certainly not going to last the test of time, which means to get people to genuinely be, to like you, um, if we're um, you know, asking Libra this question uh, or answering this question for Libra, it's going to be to be true, to be honest, to be ethical. Libra is experiencing a crisis as it defines its place among others in society. Establishing a balanced, i.e. fair and equal position within the structure of society proves challenging. Having the willingness to accept and take on responsibilities helps Libra evolve in positive ways. How this plays out depends on, and this is what I didn't mention this with the Aries, but uh, this, is, this is true for both. How this plays out, their success in society, and, and if we're going to look at this from a relationship dynamic, how, you know, Capricorn being a familial sign, yes? How successful Libra is going to be in family dynamics and social dynamics is going to be dependent on the quality of the soul's connection to conscious awareness. Same with Aries in the previous slide. So that means how connected are they to the voice of all manifest through the spirit? And we could also call that too, how connected to they, uh, or where are they at in their evolutionary state? How evolutionarily uh, um, evolved is their soul? How how in tune with their true core essence are they? The quality and circumstance of the individual's upbringing is also going to impact this on some level. Um, 
especially if they're in consensus state awareness and as well to uh, their sense of self-esteem and how self-aware the soul is, like I was saying earlier, um, that, that awareness is very important. Um, but the self-esteem is a big one too, because if we think about esteem, the word esteem, it means how much, do we, how much regard do we have for ourselves? How much respect do we have for ourselves? How much do we care about ourselves and value ourselves? All of these types of things are going to have a direct impact on how much we're willing to take from another individual, how much we're willing to let ourselves be victimized, and it's also going to have a role in how willing we are to be honest, assertive, and to, um, to have strong boundaries in these kinds of things. So let's move on. Let's move on to cancer, yeah. So when Aries, AKA the narcissist, at least from this perspective here, runs into cancer, as, and we can see cancer as family and emotional security. So we've got a, another young active phase, square, <clears throat> between Aries, cardinal fire, and cancer, cardinal water. Aries is first stage awareness, cancer is second stage awareness. And that is actually a typo because cancer is actually first stage awareness as well. Now, you might be wondering, but cancer's about family. That, you know, at least from an evolutionary astrology perspective, I think that you EA students and practitioners will, will see what I'm saying here. Cancer is actually very self-focused. Since, from what I understand of Jeffrey Wolf Green's evolutionary astrology, cancer is about our self-identity, our inner ego, these kinds of things, right? It is a very personal sign. So Cancer is making a waxing square from Aries, it's 90 degrees. First quarter phase, crisis in action, so difficulty being able to act freely without friction. Aries says, I want to achieve, I want to be me and I want to be free. Just want to be. <laughs> and Cancer says, remember that you're loved for who you are and that we are all family, and you will have both freedom and support. Because again, no, no man is an island. So Aries is experiencing a crisis as it seeks the emotional security to confidently assert its intentions of the intentions of its soul. As it interfaces with others in the world, the need to find comfort in its sense of self-identity becomes a priority. <sighs> if it avoids this stage of evolution, it could very well regress into inf infantilism. And again, how this plays out is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, soul level awareness and the quality of an individual's upbringing. Um, and want to be very clear, these are not, this, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other, other reasons to consider as well. Just for the sake of time, that's what I have here. So when we lack emotional security, especially if we consider Aries being just completely self-focused, synonymous with the narcissist uh, archetype or psychology, it is going to be very exploitative of others to glean or to foster emotional security. The issue is, though, when we approach others from such a place and even approach the development of our emotional security from such a place where you know, it's a place of cowardice at the end of the day. It's a place of fear. It's not coming from love and love for self or love for others. And so the emotional security is based in a false power dynamic that will never actually sate them or nourish them in ways that will help them to truly feel at ease within themselves, within their own identity. When Libra, the empath, encounters cancer, family, emotional security, we see Libra second stage awareness and then cancer, ignore the typo there, cancer, another sec or first stage of awareness. So cancer again, focused on self, ego, inner identity, and then Libra's focus on others, yes? So we have a waning square, closing square from cancer to Libra. So 
it is actually a last quarter phase crisis in consciousness. I apologize for all the typos in the slides. Everything I'm saying though is uh, like this is this is correct what I'm intending to say. So I do apologize for the discrepancies in the slides. Crisis in consciousness. Yes, Libra says. I need others. Is it possible to have balanced relationships? They can be feeling quite disillusioned at this point in time. They can be feeling quite emotionally starved, love starved even. And it could be that, you know, stepping into that true, healthy, natural Libra way of expressing could be quite a daunting task at this stage of their evolution and their development, archetypically speaking. Libra is experiencing a crisis in belief as it struggles to feel safe and secure knowing and being who they truly are, who they are inside with others. So they're having difficulty knowing and being that it's okay to be who they really are inside with other people, that they don't have to be that chameleon constantly, that courtesan constantly. They can really just be who they are and still be loved and supported. Like we can see here too, the need to be an equal and thus to avoid manipulations, lies, codependence, and unfairness is a challenge that can feel daunting and yet it's a requirement to complete and to move forward evolutionarily. So how this plays out, again, dependent on the evolutionary state, the quality of the soul's connection to its conscience, i.e. how connected is it to its true core essence, and the quality of the circumstances in which the soul was brought up. I'm going to move on for the sake of time. We just have a couple more slides left. So what can we all learn from the father, patriarchal or Capricorn, and the mother, matriarchal or Cancerian energies, when we take into consideration the narcissist and empath dynamic? Yeah? With Capricorn, what does a balanced and healthy Capricorn father energy look like? And before I move on, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if we think about ourselves as a trinity within ourselves, we have a mother archetype within ourselves, we have a father archetype within ourselves, and then we have our spirit, the child. If we have a strong father and a strong mother, both healthy, nourishing that child, supporting that child, teaching that child, then that child thrives and there's no need to be out of integrity with oneself, to diminish oneself, or to inflate oneself, to harm others or to be harmed or to allow ourselves to be harmed by others. Not everyone's parents biologically support ha, supported us or supported you in the, in the ways that we needed our parents may not have been ideal but that doesn't mean that we can't use the power of our mind to create and to reconnect to our optimal parental archetypes so that we can nourish and rear and bring up the child within in a way where we are balanced individuals whole individuals and not narcissistic or exploitative and not in an extreme of em empath and, and victim mentality. Now, I didn't say this in the beginning, but it's good now, good a time as ever. Empath is not necessarily objectively a bad thing. We're just looking at the extremes here in relationship dynamics where it can go awry, yeah? Uh, being an empath, everyone actually is an empath to some degree, and it's going to be different based on your own planetary elemental makeup, but everyone can sense the feelings and emotions of other people. It's an inborn faculty, even animals have it. But when the empath is inflated to the point where it's um, it completely distorted and imbalanced, it can create relationship or I guess invite relationship dynamics that cause more harm than good, even if their heart's in the right place. So yes, what does a balanced and healthy Capricorn father energy look like? Ask yourself that. This is a fun game we can all ask ourselves. And then on the other end of that, what does a balanced and healthy cancer or mother energy look like for you? 
maybe spend some time asking yourself that question over the next coming days if you're not clear on that answer right away. It's a good thing to know and don't necessarily, you know, um, compare it to what you're not getting now, although maybe you could do that if you wanted to. Um, sometimes that can help us if we know what we didn't get or what we're not getting, that can help us to know what we need and what we want to get. So if that works for you, go by all means. Um, but uh, play along with me with this if you feel so inclined. Another question. What did the parental figures who were present during your formative years teach you about how to structure your relationships? For example, what did they teach you about autonomy, authority, integrity, physical boundaries, and using others? Using is not inherently a bad thing. It's a key word for Capricorn. I use is the key word for Capricorn. So what did, your, what did the parental or father figures, not necessarily literally masculine or um, literally a male, I should say, what did the fathering influences in your life teach you about such things? Now, for the mothering and nurturing uh, influences in your life, what did the maternal figures who are present during your formative years teach you about relationships? For example, what about, um, what did they teach you about love? What did they teach you about emotional expression? What did they teach you about nourishment, empathy, compassion, and emotional boundaries? Was it what you needed? When you tap into who you are as a, as a core essence, as a spirit and a soul, was it what you needed? And if it was, what about it is ideal? And what about it maybe was, were there discrepancies? And why, were they, why would you consider them discrep discrepancies for you as an individual? This can help you to, to come into greater wholeness so that your, your interpersonal interactions and relationships are more balanced and fair and healthy. Because as I was saying in the beginning of the presentation, you know, we're going to see extremes of the narcissist empath dynamic. And then we can also see two um, less extreme examples in, in our interactions in day-to-day -day life. A lot of us can empathize with that. So finally, with balance comes equilibrium and equanimity, meeting in the middle. When we examine the polarity of Aries and Libra, we can see the extremes of self and other. We can see how it just becomes completely distorted. But we can also see, too, how when they meet in the middle, there can be a beautiful blending and beautiful harmony. Aries can teach Libra how to be more brave, more assertive, and Libra can teach Aries how to be more considerate and more aware. <laughs> yes? So, how to listen better, too, yeah? We can also see how the two can meet in the middle to find balance and a healthy sense of self without the need to manipulate or abuse one another. Who is responsible to make harmony happen in a relationship? Both individuals. It's on all of us, how we approach everything in life. It's our responsibility, yeah? So yin energies, like Cancer and Capricorn, for example, as we spoke about earlier, have a considerable role to play in balancing the energies of Libra and Aries youngness. And if you'll notice too, in the previous, uh, previous slides, and you can rewind this video to see that, um, when we are looking, I think I'll just actually go back right now and show you. Like, see here with, with Libra and with Aries, they're both surrounded by yin signs. So for them to really get into the most healthy iteration of their energy, if they take into consideration the, those yang energies, Libra and Aries, if they take into consideration the yin around them, they can truly express their yangness from wholeness and from equanimity so that they can truly be who they are without exploitation, without manipulation, and without victimization. And what results? Freedom and harmony. So yes, that's all for today. Thanks so much for being here for this presentation.
Uh, again, this was Understanding the Narcissist and Empath and Astrological Overview, and I'm Sarah DeHaven. If you're interested in working with me, I offer services at adapguidance.com, needle charts, and psychic readings. I also teach psychic intuitive development and astrology fundamentals. Um, check out my YouTube channel for my weekly forecasts. I do a really interesting forecast looking through the lens of the asteroid Lucifer so that we can get into, con uh, into connection with our... Well, what's separating us from our true core essence by looking through the lens of the separating forces as depicted through Lucifer and other points that are happening in the astrological weather at current. Uh, yes, so that's all for now. Thank you to Linda Johnson and everyone from EA Zoom meetings. That's all for now. I'll be back again soon with a great video. Well, at least I hope it's a great video. Have a great day. Thanks for being here.